Welcome to the Software Lifecycle Stories podcast. We bring you stories of what worked and sometimes what did not in the course of discovering, designing, developing, delivering and using software-based solutions as shared by practitioners who went through these situations. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Software Lifecycle Stories. I'm Chitra from PM Power Consulting and it's my pleasure to co-host this series with Shivaguru to whom you've been listening as part of the past episodes. Welcome Shiv and thank you for inspiring and showing me the way and inviting me into the world of podcasting. I've been listening to your previous episodes that you've hosted. and have thoroughly enjoyed listening to your experience in uh, devops as part of your monologue from a time when the term was perhaps not known as it is today to the power of having conversations with real users of a forex and money market trading desk as in the case you described to harness the power of user stories to build the right product to begin our conversation today i am curious about understanding your interest and pursuit of business excellence as part of your coaching journey as well as knowledge management so can you share some views and your experience through your work in these areas ah that was a turn of tables uh, chitra has been in the background in this podcast so far and uh, i've been trying to get her to co-host i'm sure that you know, with this experience of uh, just asking questions uh, you'll see more of chitra hear more from her we will be the co-host for the software life cycle stories thank you chitra it's a very good question and very um involved question at least the answer is involved no so when we talk about you know business excellence uh, there are a few dimensions that uh, go with it now the first is uh, that we need to be successful as a business no which means that uh, we have to show business results there is a popular misconception that business excellence is more like a process model or a quality model but the processes exist only to deliver results so the moment you talk about results it is all focused around the customer whoever is going to be paying you so the whole orientation of your processes or whatever you need to do would be considered as the enablers that will let you get the results so when you put all these dimensions together that is starting with the customer in mind focusing on the business outcomes ensuring that there are supporting you no know, processes or infrastructure systems whatever you need the resources that are required including things that go beyond your own enterprise and particularly for startups we don't have too many of these support systems within the organization so you need to depend on the network you need to depend on others who could complement what your offerings are they could be technology vendors they could be logistics vendors they could be infrastructure providers and so on now all these need to be driven by leadership now the leadership is not confined to a leader or a few leaders which is the co-founders but the whole aspect of looking at breaking new ground looking at options that have not been considered questioning status quo etc are all traits of leaders which is expected from pretty much every individual in the team so the business excellence is something that can be considered as all pervasive looking at both the vertical alignment of whatever the organization's objectives are along with the integration of various activities that happen so this is the part a now while doing this there would be a lot of assumptions made you know whether you call it the lean startup model or you know uh, doing the pdca kind of cycles you have to do learn adapt 
Now, this whole process of learning is what I consider as knowledge management. Knowledge management is not just keeping some documents in an archive which can be searched. It is the growing active collective knowledge of the team. Team, both internal knowledge as well as knowledge of the environment, which could be the industry that you're working in, the competitors, and, and everything that goes with it. So both business excellence and knowledge management are just labels for someone to be successful, particularly a startup. So that was the short answer. Growing, learning, and adapting. These are really insightful experiences. Thank you. So what are a few tips or top of mind takeaways for anyone building a new product or working on a new idea, which seems to be happening a lot these days? It's always uh, tempting to ask for uh, you know, one solution or you know, one silver bullet. But it is all hard work, like, you know, uh, particularly a startup. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainties and you know that the percentage of startups that succeed is quite low. Uh, with all that, I think if there are three areas that they can focus on or anybody can focus on, uh, that would probably be helpful in uh, you know, going on their path. The first is what you may call as a customer obsession uh, because it is all for the customer. The customers are the ones who are paying for you. So developing an empathy for the customers, whether it is in identifying the problems to solve or during the usage, you know, how we can make their lives better. What are the jobs that they want to get done and how can we make them successful? So that is something that has to pervade the entire organization, even as a culture, as thinking, anything, uh, any decision to be taken, you will always have the customer's interest in mind. And of course, how you can help as an organization. Once you have that, the second discipline, I would say, that you would need is the time discipline. Because when you promise even if you don't consider it as a formal promise, maybe I'm just making an announcement, but still for the customer to depend on you, for the customer to make plans based on what you have indicated, there has to be an element of trust and confidence. Now that can be built over time only when you start delivering on your promises. So the brand promise that you create must be delivered on time. I'm not talking about the quality part because that is a given. That is the basic city. Uh, sticking to timelines, sticking to the commitments that are made, understanding the dependencies. Yes, there could be changes that might happen, but keeping the customer also involved and making the plans together and always having a plan and working towards that time discipline. If we say we want to do a meeting in half an hour, let us finish in half an hour. Let us have clear objectives. If we say that, yeah, next week, we will be able to give you the alpha version. Okay, well, we'll give it. Sometimes due to either technology or other constraints, you may kind of scale it down. But still, as we talk in the agile world, make something that is release ready. Something that will cover a full cycle of a process or something that can be done and not just bits and pieces that cannot be used. The third uh, a tip, or again, it is another discipline, is uh, a data discipline. It is quite natural or normal to say that, oh, if I want data, then I need process, process makes it heavy, and then I'm a startup, I have to be lean. Or as a project, do I do my project or do I do you know, data collection? You know, it's a normal question that comes up many times. But unless you start tracking data, looking at data, whatever it is, whether it is the efforts that are spent, whether it is uh, the plan that you create, and then the actuals and the variance from the plan, whether it is the defects that are uh, introduced, whether it is the effort spent in, say, activity related to planning and futuristic versus activities that need to take care of your production systems now. So the data discipline is also required. 
So to summarize, customer obsession, time discipline, and data discipline are probably you know, three things to focus on. So simple as these might appear to be, these are hard things to do for a lot of startups. Yet, uh, I found these really practical and very insightful. I'd now like to explore a different part of your journey as a coach and uh, perhaps invite you to share some of those experiences. I'm sure you have several fascinating stories. Uh, we'll probably need about three days to talk about this. I just did the stories, uh, the top of the mind stories. There's so many of them. Um, but first of all, um, you know, this whole role of a coach or a consultant uh, is kind of um, mixed. I, mean, I would like to call myself an excellence coach, uh, where it is a combination of um, what may be called a performance coach, like in sports, where uh, the sports coaches are typically you know, uh, performers themselves who have been there, done that, and who can get onto the court and actually play. But for whatever reasons, they've chosen not to. But at the same time, they are there not only during a match, but even before the match, preparing, helping the team prepare, coming up with the approaches. And during the match, observe pretty much every movement that happens and intervene, take timeouts, provide guidance, look at changing the strategies, anything that is required. Now, Agile... Also, like with uh, some of the other sports, is a team sport. So that is where the individual coaching also comes in, in addition to the performance coaching. It is not only about the individuals, even though I said individual coaching, it is also the edges or the connections between individuals. So we look at individuals based on the roles they play, as well as the teams, the interactions between different roles and the interactions across teams and across the organization. So there are a lot of stories in terms of you know, how some of these things happen or how uh, having an external person be there you know, help. The simplest thing is, um, again, one is now acting as a mirror. When you are deeply involved in doing things, you may not notice how things are happening or what is the impact on what you do. So having a mirror helps. Now, not all aspects can be completely you know, data-driven or quantitative, which means that uh, the dashboards or the other uh, metrics that you collect will give you a certain picture, but how do you go beyond these numbers? How do you find patterns? How do you find actually some of the missing data? Uh, the other day I was um, uh, reading somewhere about uh, one of the Sherlock Holmes stories where um, the way Sherlock Holmes actually finds out you know, who did it was when there was no data. And this is about a story where a dog used to bark pretty much uh, on a regular basis. And apparently on the night that the murder took place, the dog did not bark. So if you just look at the data collected, it'll say that, uh, well, that day there'll be missing data. But then not being satisfied only with data that is available, but also data that is missing. How do you spot the gaps? So for this, some of the executive coaching styles or what we call as the power of questions and of help, where probing a little deeper, making the individual or the team reflect, go look at possibilities, and then at that point of time, use the rule that I mentioned earlier of time discipline, because we don't want to get into an analysis paralysis. You can always keep on looking for data, but the data is to help you take a decision. Now, decisions may be attached with a certain level of confidence, so which is what we try to do. So in such cases, 
look at how you can time box your decision making time box your actions and then review for instance the spike stories that most agile teams take up they must be time boxed yes they are there for unknowns they are there to explore and then get answers but we don't want to spend an inordinate number of I mean, amount of time to just get the answer or keep searching so uh, these are you know some aspects which um, you know come in whenever you start engaging with a team now during engagement it should also be clear what i'm going to do or i'm not going to do and to ensure that the team doesn't become dependent on me yes as long as uh, from a business sense it probably makes uh, you know positive sense or you can keep charging but then that is not the intent the intent is to make the teams self sufficient or how the teams can manage by themselves so the two parameters that i normally say when we start engaging with a team is that uh, first is now what is your current aspiration where are you what is the delta that we can see and how quickly can i disengage so from an intense involvement in the beginning slowly would reduce become say second level that is supporting maybe the the scrum masters or the you know, the product managers or the engineering managers and then we drawing that to observe periodically just check make sure that um, there is a course correction if anything is needed etc and then after maybe a couple of uh, releases maybe about 6 uh, months or 9 months go back and check and probably question all the decisions all the models whatever in the frameworks or blueprints that we might have set up earlier to see whether they are still valid or what is no longer relevant if something has become a habit then maybe start looking at something new something more so that we can look at the breakthrough and the next stage of performance so i don't know if this answered your question yes it certainly did and a lot more i love the parallel you've drawn between uh, sports coaches and agile management coaches and as a sports person i completely relate to what you just shared thank you especially on the aspects of showing a mirror and enabling a lot more reflection i would love to have more conversations with you on your coaching experience and looking forward to those in some time in the future moving on to what we are both part of right now uh, what drew you into the world of podcasting ha huh. i guess i'm always looking for something to learn and something that um, you know gives me say something new to do something different to do etc but a couple of underlying themes have always been there is um you know understanding the human mind you know you can say how is that connected to podcasting we come to that so that has been a theme which also led me to explore you know, knowledge management and um, when i found that there were some things that can be specified some things cannot be specified a uh, lot of these uh, you know, the implicit knowledge that is there in people and when you just look at the data when you look at the facts it may not always give you the context you know to understand why something happened or how something could have been done differently so that actually led me to explore uh, this whole concept of intuition you now while we say yeah there is data we can always uh, use a lot of mathematical models to arrive at something nowadays with you know the ai ml being talked about talking about predictive models and all that there is still something that is unexplicable which is the intuition sometimes you say the gut feel when you arrive at some decisions and how you do that there is a little gap beyond where data can take you when i started exploring that i really find you know learning from children as a very very uh, you know energizing activity uh, from our mind maybe we are also kids but then maybe we don't remember uh, what they do sometimes is unexpected and very spontaneous now when 
I started getting interested in that. I said that maybe I have to interact more with people. I need to be open to listening rather than just you know, giving out lectures or writing things and so on. And I had an interest in sharing whatever I do, whether it is in terms of writing or you know, talking, etc. And that was a kind of a shift to say that, okay, from talking, let me also start listening. So then I started actually interviewing people or asking people more questions and so on. So I find that uh, you know, podcasting as a medium has also helped me even in the last few weeks to reconnect with a lot of old contacts. They're all there, but we never found an opportunity to talk about whatever has happened since the time we connected last with some of them, um, probably years since we actually spoke. Whereas with some others, it's not been so infrequent, but still many times it is all very transactional. And then these conversations also help me uh, both reconnect and also now understand you know, the thinking behind many of the things that they did. So podcasting seemed to be a natural uh, byproduct saying, well, we have the conversation. These are all just interviews and then recording them and of course sharing it. Wow. This is a multidimensional, amazing take on podcasts. What do you see is the outreach or impact of a podcast and podcasting? Yeah, as I said, um, when you listen to okay, audio and music, I, by the way, I also listen to a lot of music. And right from my school days, I always needed something in the background. And I can't sit in a very quiet place and do something. But I can just chill and I'll go to the river or go somewhere and then I, I don't have to do anything. But when I do something, somewhere I find that having something in the background helps which I found with a few others also. Now, one difference I see between reading and uh, say listening to a podcast type of uh, audio content is that um, in reading, I can probably just skim through, probably look at uh, you know, something, all these fast techniques that are there, or maybe just jump to the last chapter to find out you know, who done it. If I can't wait. Whereas with uh, this audio medium, it becomes a little difficult because it is serialized and you need to you know, go through. And um, that also increases the need for attention. But at the same time, it is not something that is going to stop you from doing something else. So while uh, you know, walking or doing something else, this, is, this can be in the background, this can catch you. And it doesn't need you to sit in front of the screen you know, to watch something else that is happening. So you can still use some of your faculties of imagination, uh, like it happens to me at least while reading, that every word or sentence or some concept that is described or some uh, situation that is being uh, written about, uh, you can also imagine how it could be or what possibilities could be. That also triggers you other thoughts. So similarly, uh, podcasting in one way probably helps us to be better listeners and which is going to be good overall. And of course, if you don't like the topic, you can always you know, switch. But then um, once we start listening, I guess the empathy for others would also improve. And this is at a very uber level. But um, yeah, with the um, new phones and the apps, I think it's become easier to consume podcasts. So in that sense, I think it is a medium where um, uh, there is a lot of potential and um, like you need to find your place in that and then people who kind of resonate with you or people who like this. And if some of these thoughts can inspire someone or can uh, lead someone to do something in a more positive, I think uh, that's good. <laughs> this certainly makes for an interesting story by itself that we should explore more sometime later for sure. So can you share a few takeaways for people on who are keen on exploring podcasting? Um, I don't know. I think the first thing is um, the passion. Don't do podcasting for the sake of podcasting. If there is something 
that you strongly feel about that you want to express yourself or uh, share a point of view or create a platform for others to share their points of view. I think that should be first. Uh, it does require, I guess, a lot more effort than um, writing a blog post. It um, also, I mean, whatever we are doing now is uh, fairly, I would say, simpler formats of uh, podcasting. But there are many podcast-based magazines. People do a lot of research on a topic before they you know, create an, an episode. Um, so depending on your interest, what you want to do, if there is a passion that you want to share about, if there is a, a theme that you want to explore more deeper, whether it's a social theme, technical theme, whatever else. See how effectively you can convey that through the medium of only audio. Okay. Yeah, you can have supporting notes, you can have supporting videos, you can have other uh, content that can be connected. But during the podcast, you only have audio as a channel. So once you are clear about that, then uh, today technology is available and the infrastructure is also available for you to get started pretty much with a minimum budget. So don't worry about the number of listeners or how do I monetize and so on. But of course, if you have that as the primary goal, saying that, can I make money using podcasting? I mean, that's something that's a lot more serious. And then you need to uh, do a little more research and you know, work on it. So I would say, Probably as a, a, a newbie in podcasting, yeah, join the fun. And it's certainly been fun for, so far for me too, Shiv. Thanks again to you for making it so. I'm certainly excited and look forward to hosting many more podcasts. If you have stories to share, it's easy. Just contact us. Please get in touch with us at podcast at pm-powerconsulting.com. That is podcast at pm-powerconsulting.com.